sure. In a sense, everything we've done in the last 10 weeks has been preparation for this algorithm. And because the algorithm solves such an important problem, true period finding, it has profound applications in the real world. Beyond that, though, Shore's period finding and his subsequent factoring give one a sense of what it takes to do real-world quantum computing. Think of this as the first rather than the last time you'll bring your math skills to bear on some quantum algorithm. Shor's problem is the real-world version of Simon's problem. It promises to find the period A of a periodic function of ordinary integers, not that wacky mod 2 variety addressed by Simon. As we intimated last week, it does this with a one-two punch of quantum press to digitation. First, quantum parallelism tees up the ball for the oracle. Then, the QFT knocks it out of the park by enabling a Fourier basis measurement. The reason the QFT works is that it sets up a measurement of the function's spectrum, and the spectrum is where the frequency is most evident. As you all know by now, frequency is just period turned on its head. Even though Shor's periodicity is pretty much garden variety, there's a minor twist, an injective property, which we have to define before we hit the road. Also, there's an integer, big M, which defines the size of the problem, and that also needs some explanation. Once all that's done, we meet the circuit. It should look familiar. It's pretty much Simon's, except for the upper right corner. Hello, QFT. That's the operator that'll turn our preferred basis measurement effectively into a frequency basis measurement, the trick that seals the deal. The cliché, the devil is in the details, has never been truer. There are so many places where we have to use fancy math that it behooves us to first consider an unrealistically easy case. Then we get to the actual case, the so-called hard case. Before that fork in the road, things are pretty calm. We use an nth order Hadamard in the A channel to set up quantum parallelism. We then feed the oracle's B register an rth order cat zero to affect a generalized Born rule measurement. At that point, though, we'd better take the easy fork in the road. We consider the unrealistic case where the period A divides evenly into the original function's domain size. By the way, at this point in the reading, you'll see that what we're calling the domain size is big N, a power of 2. The tactic is to invoke this special injective periodicity to partition the domain into little m equal parts. That's the m to 1 quality corresponding to Simon's 2 to 1 style function. Yet another reason why we studied Simon. Doing this allows us to massage the output of the oracle's B channel into a form ideal for a generalized Born rule measurement and collapse. That collapse, as seen in the B register, is only partial, though. It narrows down the number of states in the A register, but not entirely. Just like Simon's conceptual B register measurement gave us a superposition of two states, Shor's will give us a superposition of little m states. So far, so good. We turn our attention next to the A register. What's left there as evident by the math, is a kind of function that's zero everywhere except for domain points that are separated by our unknown period A. Born's collapse manages to produce a perfectly pure periodic function with the same period A as our original and much easier to study. Finally, we hit it with a Fourier basis measurement which by now you well know is just a QFT gate followed by a Z basis measurement. In order to see what we get, we have to do a little rearranging. Measurements always produce eigenvalues, in this case an integral multiple of little m. We know that, by the way, because of an optional exercise on roots of unity presented in the very first week of class. Now, little m might not sound so exciting. 
In fact, you probably don't recognize it in this video overview. But when you read, you'll know it as the number of times our period A divides evenly into the function's domain. And if we can find M, we'll be able to compute A. There are a couple details I left out, because that multiple of M that we measure, CM, doesn't always work. We have to invoke probability theory to prove that with a constant time number of repetitions of this process, we'll eventually get a CM that does do the job. Of course, there's always a probability that we don't succeed, but that probability is vanishingly small, as we'll see. Anyway, this result is what gives the algorithm polynomial complexity. Because when you combine that constant time looping dance with the circuit around it, you'll have an algorithm whose big O is log to the fourth, extremely fast. Now, before anyone starts celebrating, we have to remember that this was the easy case and just a warm-up. This variant is so unrealistically simple, in fact, that we could have solved it using a small laptop. Still, we have the blueprint for the actual hard case, which we tackle next. The first of several things that makes the hard case hard is that we cannot apply that roots of unity argument to our B register measurement to get that beautifully pure periodic function of the easy case. But a few proof of concept doodles convince us that the function we do get looks almost purely periodic. While the spectrum in the easy case had mostly zeros, the hard case produces a spectrum that's never zero. Still, most of the values are near zero. This observation emboldens us to predict that we'll still get a small minority of all the possible measurements with high likelihood. Our prediction is supported by the math, but when we get to the top of that hill, we'll see that the peak is still above us. Those few likely frequency measurements are not themselves multiples of little m as we would like them to be. Now, annoying sidebar here. Little m doesn't even exist in the hard case, forcing us to use a slippery m tilde in its place. That technical detail aside, and we do eventually address it, our challenge here is to somehow extract that multiple c times little m tilde from our measurement. If we can do that, and we can, we'll be able to get A with a constant time likelihood. The cost of success, though, is a substantial amount of differential calculus combined with a branch of number theory called continued fractions. From my video podium, I can't help you with those details, so I make all this optional reading. But if you do decide to read it, I promise every step is included. So where are we? Well, we've got a quantum circuit plus an accompanying algorithm that makes use of a few classical continued fraction computations, and we have to compute the overall complexity. Everything is either constant or polynomial, so we do indeed get exponential speed up over the classical problem. Now, it's only relativized speed up because we don't know anything about the oracle's complexity. But for the large class of periodic functions needed for, say, RSA encryption, i.e. factoring, we do know about those oracles. They're polynomial. Therefore, in those cases, we have absolute exponential speed-up, and we can finally go out and celebrate at our favorite restaurant. Even with this ripley-sized chapter, there are a couple details I relegated to small appendices later this week. They address classical math, and they're all optional. So notwithstanding them, after today's reading, which remember is only a small subset of the chapter as dictated by the table of suggested paths, you're done with the course. You made it. And believe it or not, for the first time in 11 weeks, I can't think of anything more to say. So I'll wish you all well, and only ask that you drop me a line sometime and let me know if you found ways to use any of the math, quantum mechanics, or computer science that you learned this quarter. I wish you all the very best.